Hey guys, what's up and welcome back to my channel or welcome if you guys are new here. So for today's video, you guys can see I have a special guest. This is my amazing husband, Corey. Hello, hello. And I figured we start to do something a little different today. Uh, you guys know that The Last of Us premiered last night on HBO. So I thought it'd be kind of cool if we just kind of sat down. I put on my full face of makeup and we talked about... The video game, the show, how they compared, and all things the last, all things last us, all all things last of us. While I do my makeup, so I'm kind of mixing both my love of makeup and video games into one video, and something different, and it's kind of nice to have someone to talk to. <laughs> so you guys want to see what our thoughts are on this entire episode or the first episode, of Last of Us? Mm -hmm. How I did this look? Well, then definitely keep watching. Let me Okay, so I don't really know how to do this. I have never done this before, but I wanted to just kind of sit here and do my makeup while we talk about the episode or the first episode of The Last of Us because if you guys haven't, or if you guys couldn't tell, we're obviously huge, massive fans of The Last of Us. I have been live streaming it on my channel now for the last, I don't know, what, week and a half to two weeks. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite game in the whole world. And the premiere was last night, and we wrote a lot of notes. We haven't really shared our opinions with each other because we want everything to be, like, to raw an and organic here. Mm -hmm. And we definitely have some opinions. So I'm just going to do the two things I love most, which is putting on my makeup and talking about video games. So, <laughs> do you want to like get started, babe? I'll make sure I link all the makeup products I'm using down below, by the way. Like, we'll, I'll make sure everything's linked. Oh. So, do we talk about the episode as a whole or kind of go over it first? I go first off, I have to say, I was so freaking excited for it to finally premiere. We have fallen in love with the game back in 2013 when we first played it. It was yep. a huge bonding experience for both of us. And I loved every second of the episode last night. I'll start by saying that. I loved the episode. Mm -hmm. I thought it was fantastic and I thought that was the best rendition of a video game I have ever seen because we've seen a lot of movies that are inspired oh, from video yeah. games. Resident and Evil, Uncharted. Uncharted was so <laughs> shitty. I, I kind of like Tomb Raider. Which one? Um, the newer one, not the one with Angelina Jolie. I mean, that was okay. It was okay. They had like hints, but I really thought they did a really good job last night of. Yeah, by far the yeah. best. Um, what is it? The best adaptation? video game rend or adaptation? Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. say rendition, but <laughs> video game adaptation ever. It was so freaking good, and I I love the intro. Um, I love how they started talking about the pandemic, like in the nineteen sixties. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a new take because we actually listened to the podcast. After. The podcast is super insightful. Yeah. And uh, we got to see how they kind of explained why they did what they did. Um, in the video game, that doesn't happen, by the way. Like, you're in the video game, you just kind of start off with Sarah and Joel. Yeah, no, literally. You go straight into her waking up at night. Yeah, pretty much. Well, she gets the birthday gift, and then... Yeah, she w she wakes up at night and uh, looks around the house, and Joel, dad, is not there. Mm-hmm. And then she starts seeing the newscast, and then the explosions go off, and then Joel comes bursting in. Yeah. And in the show, they kind of start off in the 1960s, and they actually kind of explain, like, pandemics and, like, what pandemics are. They go from, like, a viral pandemic to a fungi pandemic. And mm -hmm. what's really crazy is that's never been seen here in the world. And they talk about how it, and it's very, it's like a very true statement they're talking about in the podcast about how if a fungi, you know, pandemic were to break out we'd be in serious trouble as yeah. like a human race because it's so much more complex than something viral or, or bacteria it's it's right and cordyceps are real like it's a real fungi parasite that takes over ants and actually controls the mind and body and it's a really cool it leaves fungi. the host alive <laughs> yeah and i was telling him last night that i wonder if like the show or like the movie i wonder if the, um, i wonder if the video game was kind of inspired by like monsters inside me a little bit because I watch so much monsters inside me. <laughs> I do. And there's definitely some parasites that have taken over the host body and like will attack the human body, but not in a way to hurt or kill, but to live and thrive. And I kind of wonder if that's where the inspiration came from. Uh, it was really cool. But I really loved how they did the intro. They kind of explained it so that as a non-video game player, you kind of have a basic background to what could potentially happen. It kind of sets the scene up for what then does happen in 2003. Oh, which yeah. is weird that it kind of took place in 2003 because in the game... It's... 2013 2013 right and, and then the they the, fast forward 20 years later to 2023 which makes sense 
But the only thing I didn't like, though, as I told him, it kind of bothered me. Why do they put the date September 26th? I don't know. Maybe we'll find that out later. Um, in the podcast, they say that there's a lot of tiny little breadcrumbs that if you actually paid attention and kept like mental notes of, that they would pay off in future episodes. So maybe certain things like that uh, will show themselves later on in the series. Um, but I mean, it's something that's so insignificant. Like in the game, it's in October. In this but story, I mean, like, it's I September. So well, it, it doesn't really change anything. It does a little bit, only because like <clears throat> in the game, they really play off that it's in October. Because like even like when you're playing the second game and you have to no longer just find notes that have like the combination codes to get in the saves, you actually have to like solve the puzzles. And it's very well known that it's in October 2013 because that's one of the codes for the save. And then when Ellie, she's a kid, she goes to like, Halloween stores and finds all this cool Halloween stuff. They talk about Halloween and like people dressing up. And I don't know. I just thought mm. that they kind of missed the mark on that. I was like, why'd they change it? But At least to me. Anything they do, they're going to have a reason for. Right. I will say I love the opening sequence too with the music. I loved seeing the music and I loved like what, the whole intro the, scene. Yeah, I thought that was actually really, really cool. Fun fact is the company that made that intro scene is the same company that HBO hired to do the Game of Thrones intro and the House of Dragons intro. You could definitely see that one. Yeah, it looks yeah. a lot of like those two other shows. Yeah, you could definitely see that. Um, I did love the fact they kind of built the backstory with Sarah, just because in the game you really don't get to see Sarah that much. You only play her mm -hmm. for a very short period of time. So it was kind of cool. They kind of set you up and gave you the backstory so you can kind of connect with the character more and kind of see the dynamic between Joel and uh, Sarah at the time, which mm -hmm. I thought was really, really cool they did that. Do you notice the subtle little thing with the watch when during the breakfast scene? No. So there's a breakfast scene, and when he's getting up, he goes to check the time. He checks his wrist that has nothing on it, and he goes, and like, like reminding himself, oh, my watch doesn't work anymore. Got it. And got up, looked at the time on his phone, and then went about his day. Oh, I also love the fact that Sarah was wearing the same shirt that she's wearing in the video the exact game. same outfit. That was so the cool. Was I was so excited when I saw that. Um, I definitely feel like it's kind of cool because, like, you get to see the neighbors. Like, in the video game, you don't see the neighbors. You just know there's neighbors that... Well, so you do, but you don't. So, because this right. came up in the podcast. In the in the show, you have the neighbor kind of crash through the back, the back door, the sliding yeah. glass door. And he's infected. And then Joel, I believe, shoots him, right? Right. Um... In the show, they were in the podcast about the first show. It was Neil Druckmann and Craig Mazin, uh, the two showrunners. And they were talking about how uh, they had the ability to kind of expand on that neighbor and make it a little bit more of a creepy story. So they were like, well, what's more creepy than just a middle-aged guy bursting through the door? What about if it's going to be like an elderly woman? And she's so comically, I wouldn't say dead, but... But like in the, they use this term, they made her comically incapable of anything. She right. can barely eat. She's deaf. She can barely move anything because they wanted to showcase how brutal the cordyceps infection was and how it can go into the mind and bypass all of those different things and make you animated again and completely control you. And by the end of that whole sequence, she was sprinting out the front door. Although I think she like snapped her ankle and broke her leg because her bones are so brittle, but yeah, but I mean she couldn't even move out of her wheelchair. She couldn't speak. She couldn't hear anything, and she literally was sprinting. Yeah, she was. It was brutal. Well, that's like we we see that later on, but like we first see the neighbors, and then you see Sarah go to you see Sarah go to school. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand what the light. Oh, you know, maybe I do now. Mm. Where uh, look for the light. Uh, fire, that could have been like a little firefly reference, but there was like a scene where this girl's bracelet was kind of reflecting light at Sarah and she just kind of looked over it. I never really understood what the reference was unless it's like where there's darkness, look for the light, maybe like a firefly reference. Yeah, but that's 20 years later. I right. think honestly, it was just to show you that because you're listening to the teacher. Right. And she's writing down every word the teacher's saying. And that was you them telling the audience, don't worry about what the teacher's saying because she even zones out and stops paying attention to it. And then very clearly and very audibly, you hear a kid cough in the background. I didn't pay attention to that. Oh, yeah. And I even wrote it down right here. Um, and the kid literally just goes in the background and just starts coughing. And then it's dead stops. And then after that, that's when that scene switches. Which I still feel like you're not allowed to cough to this day in public because of COVID. No, yeah. You <laughs> cough or sneeze or anything and people are like... 
I mean, like, literally, we were we were at Publix earlier today, and I heard this kid just kept coughing, and I actually, like, looked at the kid, like, oh, my God, cover your mouth, you know? <laughs> so, like, I could definitely uh, see why they probably put that scene in there. Mm-hmm. But I do think it's cool, because when they went to the watch shop, you can definitely see, like, a lot of, like, ambulance going by with, like, cop cars, and, like, a SWAT thing drove by, which it didn't acknowledge it. They didn't say anything about it, but then the watch shop closed within 30 minutes because of listening to, like, I guess, stuff happening on the news. So you're kind of getting, like, ooh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like getting kind of like hyped up, getting like kind of stuff scared. starting to go down. But yeah. you're, you're the whole intro of the game. You're from Sarah's POV, and you're at the and house she's a time. child, and right. so she's not paying attention. She doesn't know what's going on. That's more of an adult thing. So right. I like that they kind of left you in the dark in the show as well, because it was it like she doesn't know what's going on. She's going to school. She's got to get this watch fixed. It's her dad's birthday. She's gonna come home and give him the present. It reminded me a little bit of uh, War of World Z. With, like, the intro with, like, hearing, like, what's going on in the radio. Because in World War Z, there was a breakfast scene. And they were listening to, like, some sort of outbreak happening in, like, India. And they weren't really sure what it was. And the same thing happened here. They Mm. talked about how there's, like, an Mm. outbreak somewhere. They didn't really know where it was. They are trying to figure it out. And then they sent her home. And she's home. Uh, She goes to the neighbor's house to take care of the old lady again with like i guess the lady's daughter is i'm gonna assume or like i think caretaker. so yeah but like it's really creepy because like there's a moment where sarah stops her homework to go find a dvd and the old lady's in the background and she's like blurred i looked at Corey. i was like that is some fourth kind crap right there because oh, they had the her mouth ha, ha. like dude that it was very creepy it's like what is that supposed to like signify like i didn't understand what was that supposed to signify it probably signify that that's probably like the uh cordyceps kind of like taking over her body yeah, at the moment. I, think, I mean, in my opinion, I think that that is kind of showing you the significance of when this is hitting her. The show kind of like letting you know this is when the infection finally gets to her brain and and like takes over. And she actually does start to animate. She Her hands start to come up. Her mouth drops open, but it's all blurred. So it gives you that like suspense of like what's really happening and you don't know yet. But if that's the case, why did it take so long for her to then attack? But like, it took until, like, 2 o'clock in the morning for her to attack if she's already had her mind taken over by, like, 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You know what I mean? Well, we don't know what time it was. I mean, I don't remember figuring out what time it was, but it was a few hours. Remember, yeah. it. Remember, so, in if we're kind of fast-forwarding here, but when you go into present day, there's a chart breakdown, and it was talking about bites. And a bite anywhere close to the brain is going to be 5 to 10 minutes or 5 to 15 minutes, something like that. This, she wasn't bitten. So I think it was more of like she had ingested or taken in somehow. Right. So maybe it takes a little bit longer. I thought spores were not a thing though. I thought they were the only thing when they were like Well, the, how, was, how did the, the disease happen in the first Unless place? Unless she got bit on the bottom and she just didn't know. She couldn't By talk what? about Someone could have been affected because they they talked about how people in downtown were affected. Specifically, they said that the neighbor kept going to the hospital over and over and over again. So Mm -hmm. what if someone's infected there, bit her at like the bottom of her foot by her leg and she doesn't know because she's essentially paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And that's how long it took. But it's just they make it seem, that was one thing I was kind of just confused about because like they make it seem like, you know, five to ten minutes before it takes over. It could take 24 hours. But if she starts getting animated and the cordyceps start taking over her mind, why did it take her so long to then eventually attack when... The rest of the show and in the game, it takes mere seconds, just depending. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, just make it seem like once it's once it's taken over, it's it's taken over. <clears throat> but they made it seem like, oh, she was just fine sitting there. I don't know. That's something I thought was a little off. Like, that didn't, contingency didn't make sense to me. At least, I'm maybe I'm not making sense. I don't know. <laughs> uh-huh. But it didn't make sense to me there. But then you see Sarah go with Joel. They're sitting on the couch. She, and yeah, then she goes back home and Joel comes home. She gives she gives Joel the watch. And that was actually almost like verbatim when she's like, he's like, where'd you get the money? She's like, drugs. That actually happened in the video game. Oh, so yeah, that was yeah, a cool that's straight from nod. the game. Yeah, I was so excited to see that. And then we didn't understand, though, because technically in the game, Joel is gone somewhere. I never really know where Joel's at. Like, he didn't, didn't really say. I think he was, like, working or something like that. But in the show, Joel left to go get Tommy because Tommy got arrested, which did not happen in the game. No. And I forget, did that was that talked about in the? I don't I don't recall if it was or not. Well, they just needed a reason to get Tommy out or to get Joel out of the house. Yeah. So originally, when he said like I'll be at home at nine p.m. or whatever, and I figured okay, he's gonna come home late from work, and that's gonna be right when everything's going down. But they also needed to make sure that he got the watch. Yeah. So I think that was their way of getting him home giving him the watch because it's a very significant part of the story and then getting him back out of the house so that way it can line back up with the game of he comes in as shit's going down 
I loved how they did it in the game, but I also really loved how they did it when Sarah wakes up at two o'clock in the morning, goes and finds the neighbor and sees the old lady essentially attacking her husband and the caretaker. But the only thing I thought was so weird, and he liked it because we had to talk about this, they had this really weird stuff coming out mm -hmm. of her mouth. I mm -hmm. thought it was originally just like hair. When she pulled back, I thought it was just like hair from the lady. It was so creepy. It it's was like strands so, of fungus, uh, like it was the extensions thing. of the disease. Like, I don't know if you look in uh, if you've seen the trailer or if you know anything about the game, the clickers, they're like, they have like mushrooms and stuff growing off of them because it's a fungi. Right. But so it's like coming out of their mouth, like tentacle things. It was, it was cool. I thought it was actually, it was cool. It was really creepy. I was not expecting to see that. And then like, obviously the, she runs out and Joel pulls up with Tommy and they essentially kill her. So they definitely changed how they did it in the game, mm, but I still but love how what? they did it. What did they kill her with? A wrench. It was, yeah, it was a, a melee giant, weapon. Right. But signature melee weapon from the game. Yeah. And they definitely like zoomed in and highlighted like, hey, we're already day one using melee weapons that you use the entire game. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. And then we obviously get in the truck. And I kind of liked how they had the neighbors come out like, Joel, what's going on? And he screams at them to go inside. And then like the neighbors come and attack those people. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. drive off. Now that whole driving sequence was pretty spot on. I love how they had the house burning. Although the house in the game is on the right hand side. And the show that on the left hand side. If, yeah, if you want to get it super so technical. Cool. It, but was it was on the so other cool. side of the road. But whatever. Yeah, but the way they did it was so cool. Because like you just get the perspective of inside the truck. Just like you do inside the game. When they got to the street. When you see the ambulance going one way. They turn the other way. I was like, that's exactly what happened in oh, the Oh, the T intersection. So and they show the signs for the highway yeah it, it literally spot on identical from the game yeah the camera angle like from her pov where you see tommy driving and joel in the passenger seat and like that whole dashboard identical from the game and it looked fantastic absolutely fantastic we loved how that looked i loved how that whole scene pretty much transpired they obviously changed something them some things up like there's mm -hmm. never any airplanes in there that crashed that did not happen but i feel like it really added i dynamic to the game mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it kind of reminded me again of war or z with the plane crashing i was like oh, oh so look, this he didn't aspect. mention that scene specifically in the podcast but when he was talking about it he's like look in the game a lot of the action you experience is you as the character running around right but as a viewer you're not running around so they they get to add a lot more extra action right so i think that's when when they kind of did that cool twist by adding the planes in because it makes it way more dramatic. And it also kind of reminds you yeah, of World War Z when they're like all in the planes and stuff. Right. Um, but, and they throw a nod to this when they're in the truck and yeah, they yeah. pull up into the street where all the people are and there's a, like a, a movie theater experience. They almost get hit by a car. Um, in the game, they get hit by that truck and they crash and then they wake up just like they do in the show. But instead, they, like, throw a nod to it by the truck almost hitting them. And you're like, okay, wait, hold on, they're safe. The movie theater scene happens. And then you look back and this plane crashes and, like, what, a piece of engine or something comes smashes against the building and, and Knocks kills Knocks everybody them. out, yeah. So they still got the same result, but they added a little bit more action to it, which made it a little bit more visually pleasing. So I think... Uh, so far, every change they've done, I think makes, they did a really sense. good I job. Thought it looked, I mean, I thought that initially that the first 30 minutes with Sarah and Joel was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then when Tommy separated, that obviously happens in the game, but obviously in a different way. You see Joel run to that red door just like you do in the game, and then you see someone chasing after him, which is exactly what happens in the game. Because like, mm -hmm. you, you hear it the whole time, you're like, yep. oh, I gotta run. He runs out to that, like, it looks like the outdoor patio of, like, a bar. Yeah. And there's, like, the hanging, like, Edison lights. Yeah. That's, like, straight from the game. I think the only difference, and this is super, super technical and doesn't matter at all, right. is he runs out of that patio area and there's a wall that has like a broken open area and he goes out that wall and kind of down a ravine a little bit and that's where he runs into the guard. And here it was just, he runs into a grass field and there's a guard there. Right, right after. But like that kind of that, that thing happened. The only thing like I wish the guard was said is like he didn't say anything, but he, in the game he said, you know, sir, she, she's a child. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. But they didn't say that. He just he kept showed like, yep. empathy for yep. Joel and, and, and Sarah. Like he didn't want to do it. But I mean, they kind of switched it up though, a little bit when at the after he fired his AR, they got knocked on the ground. And he started pointing his gun kind at of Joel. He said, I'm so sorry. Like, I don't want to do this, mm -hmm, but this mm -hmm. is my order. Yeah. And then. So real subtle changes. But... And then Tommy does come, shoots him. Yep. And then that whole scene was Sarah dying in Joel's arm. I cried in the video game multiple times. And I cried mm -hmm. when I saw the show last night. Yeah, and they put great. the music. There were subtle clues of the music. I, I, pay, I love 
the soundtrack to The Last of Us 1 and 2. So to hear just the small hints of music throughout the entire 30 minutes of the scene, you could hear, I was like, oh my god, this literally is the music from the game, which I was always so scared they were not going to put that in there, and they were going to switch it up. But no, they made it so beautiful. I loved how they did it. And uh, I thought that was absolutely beautifully done between the two actors, Pedro Pascal. And I don't, unfortunately, know the actress that plays Sarah, but I thought the scene was really beautiful. And I thought that captured that moment perfectly. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was done really well. But very, like, almost, like, spot on, in my opinion. Yeah. So now we're at, in the game and in the show, where it cuts to black. And in the game, it shows The Last of Us title yeah. screen and their intro. <clears throat> and that's when that would have happened, I guess, here. But in the podcast, they were talking about it. They actually made that intro, but they decided that they wanted to do the the scene at the very beginning of the show where they go back in the 1960s and they're showing that interview, that like talk show interview about mm -hmm. cordyceps, because they really wanted to emphasize that this disease does not just come out of nowhere. Just like every real disease out there, we know about it years and years and years and years in advance and just know that something's possible but maybe it'll never happen and then it does like someone out there knew that this was going to happen and it's just taken forever to get to this point it wasn't just some random thing that just a light switch flipped and all of a sudden now cordyceps are everywhere well because i talked about global warming and how the warming could affect mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. so yeah they, they wanted to emphasize that this has been a long time coming it wasn't just some random spur of events that happened out of nowhere yeah. so they decided to go with that route instead of the the game intro where it happens right after sarah dies now, <clears throat> I didn't really understood, like, because when, once it goes fast forward 20 years later, like, mm -hmm. you get to see just, like, Joel kind of wakes up in his own home, and, like, you know, he kind of starts his day within mm -hmm. the Fedra, but in the in the show, they start off with this little weird kid. At first, yes. it's like, I was like, who is this? I thought, I was like, is this supposed to be, like, Ellie as a kid somehow finding her way to Boston? Mm -hmm. Like, I thought that was so creepy, and then I was like, are they trying to copy, like, you know, The Walking Dead with their beginning scene? I didn't so, really understand that. And then when you watch the podcast, the podcast, they mm -hmm. kind of explain why they did that, which I'll let you say, because you've heard it more than I did. Yeah. Um, so at first I was the same thing. I was like, is this somehow going to be like a weird, like younger Ellie or something? Right. Like I was confused. And the red shirt kind of made you feel that way because right. she has a red shirt in the game. Um, but they wanted you, they wanted to introduce Fedra as a possible enemy and kind of show their ruthlessness. Now in the game, you wake up as Joel, and this is your tutorial period, or period where you learn how to do everything. It shows you the buttons and what to press and blah, blah, blah. And while you're doing that, you walk by a firing line, basically, of people using this device that looks like, I don't know, like a giant iPad or something. I don't really know. Um, and <clears throat> they touch it to their neck, and it glows green or red. Green means you're safe. Red means you're infected. And as soon as they see someone infected, boom, pull the gun out and they shoot them right then and Which there. Which is crazy because like in, when I play the game, I don't even pay attention to that. It's going off on the side. Because so, I'm too busy it's... listening to them talk about the ration cards not being there. I'm not mm -hmm. even paying attention mm -hmm. to what they're doing in the background. Yeah. It's just, um, and um, what's the guy that plays Joel? Pedro Pasco? No. Or Troy Baker? Troy Baker. Troy Baker was talking about how it's very pedestrian. Like you could look at it or you could just keep going along with the tutorial. So it had nothing to do with like... It was, it was all your choice of whether or not to pay attention to it. Right. Um, they wanted to show that, but not necessarily super graphically, while simultaneously bringing up the scanner, because the scanner plays a role later on with Heli. Yeah. And so they wanted to show you the significance of what happens when that scanner glows red. So they had the little kid come in. They scanned him. He went red. They took care of them. But they did it in a really nice way, though, which I right. thought was nice. And the reason they decided to do that and not shoot him is because they wanted to then lead directly into Joel and show how drastically he's been affected by losing his daughter because he then has to go and pick up that kid's body and chuck him into a fire, and he has zero hesitation for it, as were the lady he was Tess. working with. Tessa. Tess. That, that wasn't Tess. Yeah, that was Tess. Was it? Yeah. I, it didn't look like her. But anyways, okay. Um, <clears throat> the lady he was working with, like, looked at the kid and was like, I can't do it. I can't yeah. pick up this kid's body and throw him into the fire and burn him. So Joel just picked him up and did it. So they were trying to really, like, show, like, Joel's different. He's so much more hard and cold and, and like, distant and emotionally broken because of what happens with Sarah. Yeah. So they used that kid to show all of those points. And kind of get you to that same point of now you're in that tutorial section of the game where you're meeting Joel, you're walking around Boston, trying to figure out, you know, what's what. 
So that was kind of cool they did that. <clears throat> and I do like how they kind of show, like, Tessa's character actually getting beaten up, sort of, by Robert's men. Because mm-hmm. in the game, she just says, I got jumped by Robert's men. But this one, you can actually kind of see. Yeah, they just tell you about it. You don't actually experience it. As right. we're here, you get to experience it. So that's cool. And they also talk about, like, why there's, like, a lot of Firefly in Boston. Because technically in the game, they're outside of Boston. They're not inside Fedra at all. But in this, in the in the show... They're all inside. They're the ones doing like the um, graffiti. Yeah, that. I couldn't think of the word for it and whatnot. So I thought it was kind of cool they did that. And then they also explained why uh, they kind of showed Ellie's backstory because in the game, we don't get to see any of that. In the game, you just know that Marlene delivers Ellie essentially to them. And in the show, you kind of got to see, kind of get to have some unanswered questions, but they never really do answer though exactly how they find uh, uh, her. I never, because in the no, game, they, they don't just, ever show that either. Um, no, they just kind of insinuate that they have her. Yeah. As we're in the show and in, in the podcast, um, Neil Druckmann was talking about how, like, there was so many different things they wanted to do in the game and wanted to talk about, but they ended up scrapping. So now this is their opportunity to kind of do those things. Um, and I think expanding upon Ellie's origin story was kind of one of them. So saying, you know, Marlene knows her she knows riley well because riley was a firefly but i don't know i just feel like you're like marlene's up here how does she know everyone because she was recruited to the fireflies it's in the left behind segment oh i guess she was a firefly and she was coming in to say goodbye to ellie because she was going to be a firefly Mm, okay well still like she it's she knows riley she knows like Ellie from the beginning and placed well, Ellie with the Fedra Military School. Technically, Marlene was friends with Ellie's mom. So I think Ellie's mom might have been a firefly. Possibly. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. But they didn't really ever explain why. Maybe they will, but they didn't really ever explain why she put her in the Fedra School. Not yet. Not but, in episode one. And not even in the game either. They don't really mm-hmm. get that. They don't really explain that too much. It'd be kind of nice to see how they do it, kind of explain stuff. I also told Corey that I actually kind of liked seeing. Tessa, Tessa's and Joel's relationship because it's always insinuated in the game that those two had something going on mm-hmm. because like spoiler <laughs> big spoiler I don't want to say this but later on Tess gets bit and she ends up dying and she says to Joel like if you ever like cared about me if there's enough here to let me do this like let me die my way that kind of insinuating like oh they did have relationships so I like how they showed it in the game or in the show that like obviously they have something that happens some love between them because Tess you know, climbs into bed with him and they sleep together. Like, not sex, just, like, sleep. Physically sleep, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they created a new aspect for the show. They created these, like, ham radio controllers um, that Joel uses, and everyone actually uses, to kind of communicate with other people from other areas, other uh, quarantine zones. Um, they're in the Boston quarantine zone, obviously, so they're reaching out to other radio towers and kind of, like, trickling messages along between each other. Um, that does not happen in the game. <clears throat> now, Neil Druckmann was talking about how in the game, you have this tutorial mode that you have to go through and explain everything, and so they can't shove too much plot down your face because it's too overwhelming, so they have to kind of worry about all that. As we're in the show, the viewer is sitting on a couch or whatever, so they don't have to worry about that. They have to fill all that and add a little bit more drama and a little bit more action, um, so they did. And they wanted to make the the bringing Ellie somewhere as more of a annoyance and kind of hindering Joel from doing something that he really needed to do. So they changed it. In the game, he has no contact with Tommy. And later on in the game, he just stumbles upon him. As where in the show, he um, does have contact with Tommy and he loses contact with him. For three weeks, it's been he still has no idea where he is, what's going on. So something is wrong. And now he needs to get a hold of a car battery so he can put it in a car, get it working, and travel to Tommy and save his brother. Yeah, but I found <clears> that to be just a little bit annoying just because that's so far off from the game. It's completely different. Like, mm-hmm. I loved in the game that he didn't know where Tommy was, haven't seen Tommy in 10 years when so they finally did reconnect. It was such a powerful moment for them. So for the game aspect to be like, oh, I'm looking for batteries. And like, Joel is a smuggler. He's a smuggler in the game. He's a smuggler in the, sh- in the show. But he was smuggling drugs. And in the game, it's really referenced that he's smuggling guns. Like, he's, smugg- he's, a, he's a gun smuggler. But I didn't like how they made Joel take drugs. Because it's not in the game at all. 
Mm. So I get why he did it because obviously he helps you sleep at night with all the trauma he's been through. It's but showing the trauma. I get it. And but I just... drugs is a lot more realistic when you look at society versus weapons. Like the average civilian is not worried about how many guns they have. That's what the militia, the fireflyers were, are, were trying to figure out. So Yeah, well, they, make, they change up the story. So instead of when they go to find <clears> Robert <throat> to find... Their guns, they, they're looking for a battery instead so they can leave and go find Tommy. Yep. I get why they changed it, but just as a lover of the game, I'm just like, mm, I just didn't like how they made Joel take drugs. I was kind of like, that's just very different than how he is technically in the in the, in the game. Right. So I get why they did it, but um, I just didn't care for that aspect. But I did like how the fact that you do kind of get to see Ellie's attitude, Ellie's sass, mm-hmm. which is with the fireflies. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a conversation we had yesterday. I I am so far very happy with how Pedro Pascal is playing Joel. I like it. Now, when it comes to Bella Ramsey, I think she's a phenomenal actress, but I don't see Ellie yet. I don't see Ellie yet in terms of how she's portraying it. Not saying that she's not going to do a good job. I'm very open to her. But I just, I, I'm still not fully seeing her yet. That's just my opinion, though. Mm-hmm. And you have a very different opinion. Well, I wouldn't say it's the opposite necessarily because I love Pedro Pascal. He yeah. plays the main, like my favorite Disney or Disney character. My favorite Star Wars character is the Mandalorian, which is Pedro Pascal. So him as a whole is great. Um, I do like how he showed Joel differently from like day zero, I guess you would say, versus 20 years later. Right. Because sh- he holds himself a lot different and everything. So I definitely um, respect that because the way he ch- shows how Joel changes. Um, but Ellie, I think, in the first episode, the voice, I think, was on point. Um, I mean, obviously, there are little tiny changes. I don't but see the voice. It, the, the inflection she puts in the way th- that she talks and the sarcasm and the aggression she uses and the sass she brings, I think, is exactly Ellie. Like, she's kicking the plate back right away. She's flicking off the guard immediately. She's right. As soon as she gets thrown into the room by Tess and Joel, she instantly turns around. She's like, freaks out and calls him an asshole. Okay, like, yeah, that's I mean, exactly that, from just, the game. And I it's don't hear, on point. I don't hear her voice, I guess. I'm just, I mean, obviously I'm more open to it. And I'm sure it'll get better as the, as the time progresses throughout the show. But I just personally did not necessarily see it at first for me. Yeah. It, it's just, I, but I'm very open. I think she's a phenomenal actress. But I just, was kind of like, oh, I'm still mm-hmm. waiting to see my Ellie. Because to me, Ellie is this really badass chick. I love but her you're so also, much. But you also are factoring in. Older Ellie. Right, 100%. older Ellie, where she's a lot more aggressive. And she's a lot more like Joel in part two. I will say, I really do like the character that played Tess. Tessa, I think she's doing a phenomenal job as her. Mm-hmm. And I love seeing Marlene because Marlene's Marlene in the, yeah, the, in the game. It's the same actress. The same actress. It's really nice, the nice to like, hear her voice and whatnot. So I do like the dynamic. I also liked how when Joel and Tess are like in the underground, they kind of come across their first like Infected. Clicker, yeah. sort of. Um, but they don't really show. like I mean, at that point, that's where you like learn the tutorial of learning how to sneak and do like the listening mode. Like You learn all that, but obviously in the show, they can't necessarily show <laughs> that. <laughs> I, I would be no. shocked if they did a listening mode. That would be kind of cool they did, though. But like you kind of get it, I feel that. But like they obviously changed that whole scene because technically... When Joel and Tess meet Ellie and Marlene, they're outside of Boston. Like, they're outside of Fedra. But this whole episode pretty much takes place inside Fedra. Mm-hmm. So, like, you get to kind of see that. Well, I, I get why they switched it. But as a as a fan of the game, I'm like, oh, it'd be kind of cool if they're already outside. Like, they've already started their travels and going through stuff. But I get why they didn't. Ellie, I did like seeing Ellie attack Joel because that does happen in the game. When she first mm-hmm. comes across him, very much so that happens. And you kind of get to see, like, their relationship already starting and whatnot. Um, so I did like how they did the whole thing, and then I thought it was really cool that when Joel and Ellie went back to his place, um, he went to take a nap, and when he woke up, she said, you mumbled, because that actually did take place in the game as well. So, yep. Yep. They, and they liked the raining aspect of it outside. And then I think you said you liked how the radio factor was, because that's, like that's, that's, that's not that's not The radio game. scene inside Joel's apartment is non-existent. There is no radio. Um, I did see a continuity error, actually, in that exact scene. <clears throat> so when Bella Ramsey opens up the book, or Ellie opens up the book, there's that paper on the inside, and it says B slash F for Bill and Frank. And then it says 60s, 70s, and 80s, 60s music being nothing new. Um, I'm assuming is they don't have anything new for Joel to bring back in or whatever. Right. 
um, 70s is, you know, something new or whatever it was. And then 80s was a red X. Um, and we've deducted that that is danger or something's going on or you know, there's an emergency or whatever it may be. Um, and she opens it up, looks at the paper, and then looks right at Joel and says, who's Bill and Frank? Yeah, I didn't get how she understood the, like, knew their names. I didn't see Bill and Frank anywhere. But the thing is, is I think that was a mistake. Got it. I think Bella Ramsey knows it's Bill and Frank. So she said Bill and Frank, and everyone in the show knows it's Bill and Frank. So I think it just may not have been caught. Yeah, because we watched that episode several times already, mm -hmm. and I kept looking. I'm like, it just says B and F, so how does she know? And no, it, I, we watched the episode three times so far. It have it aired last night. Yeah. And in all three episodes, or all three times, you like I could not find anywhere that there was Bill and Frank. So I think that was just a continuity error. Um, it happens, especially with HBO. We all know that the last <laughs> season of Game of Thrones... <laughs> There's a Starbucks Daenerys cup. Daenerys <laughs> Targaryen had a Starbucks cup sitting on the table with the logo showing, like... You know, you would have Starbucks paid for that. Shop right? at Starbucks. Like, Daenerys, so come it, here. It happens, and when everyone caught it, HBO freaked out and digitally edited it out. But right. it, errors happen. Um, I think that was definitely an error because I don't see Bill and Frank anywhere. They never talked about Bill and Frank. They haven't mentioned him to her in any way, shape, or form. No. Um, so, yeah, I think that was definitely a continuity error. But, but you said that uh, in the interview, no Dreckman said that he wanted... Bill to have more screen time because technically in the game he's only there for a very short period of time. Yeah. So you, there's no like radio contacting to get like, hey, half stuff for you to smuggle. No, none you of that. just you're you're making your way down your journey, mm -hmm. and you upon yourself to this this town, which I don't want to go too into detail and ruin it for people that don't know the game, but this town is Bill's town. That's what yeah. it's called, and there's even like multiplayer maps or levels for The Last of Us that are called Bill's Town, and it's it's just what it is. Yeah. Um, that, that you just stumble upon it. You're like, oh, hey, this is Bill's town. As we're here, it's like, Bill's basically like calling him for help is what it seems like. Yeah. Or what I'm kind of gathering. But that's at the end of the episode though. Yeah. It's still in this episode. Yeah. But he's like, he's, they're suggesting that Bill is playing an 80s song because 80s songs mean danger is kind of what we're deducting from it. So, and I'm thinking that me, like, something's going on and he's, like, letting, letting Joel know that I need but help. But that's, that's very much at the end of the episode, though. You kind of fast forwarded there for one second. Because we're still, like, because, like, technically, there's no music that played when Ellie said, Ellie guessed what the 80s was. Oh, I thought, well, you're just insinuating that she guessed. She said... There's a song that goes, wake me played. up before you go-go. And then he and that's said, an 80s he song. goes, oh shit, oh my gosh. And then she goes, ha, gotcha. No song played when he was asleep. She was just trying to get what it was. Oh. And then I did like how that there was a sweet sentimental moment though when she was pretty much saying that she was scared, pretty much. And he kind of comforted her even though he doesn't know her and didn't care to take care of her. Yeah. <laughs> and then they leave. And then when they leave, they, they I like how it wasn't exactly the same as the game, but I like how it was like a big homage to the game where it's like rainy you can mm -hmm. see like the broken you know cement and stuff like that you see ellie getting tested and she comes up negative and they want to like kind of kind of take her out and then i did like how ellie stabbed the guard because that's what happened in the exactly game. exactly in the game as soon as he goes to read her she knows that she's gonna show positive yeah so he sta or she stabs him before he can even see the screen as soon as as soon as he detected or like hit her with the scanner um she like went to go and stab him because she was hoping that he wouldn't see the screen. And I don't think the guard saw the screen. No. It just it showed up on the detection, showed up on the ground. And then you see, like, the guard step back and basically aim his gun at Ellie. Which gave Joel a flashback Which to gave Yeah, yeah, it gave Joel a flashback of Sarah. And this doesn't happen in the game, but they were talking about it. And they said, oh, I really wanted to show, like, how how much PTSD Joel has from that scenario or from that thing that happened part later on in the game. Right. So they wanted to do a flashback and it basically was just them showing you what is going through his mind. And he instantly thought this is exactly how my daughter died. I can't let this happen again. And he just lunged and just destroyed that dude. And it was just like, like he saw red and he kind of like comes out of it and looks back and has that moment with Ellie where nothing is said. She just looks at him and I think she finally realizes like what this man is capable of. Mm -hmm. And he kind of looks back at her and it's just like that just happened. Um, sorry, kind of. Right. And then I like how when they leave, 
you see the rain with the fallen buildings. That's exactly like how the game looked. Well, and you can hear the clickers and stuff like that. Breaking them out of that scene, Tess picks up the scanner and sees that, that she's infected. Yeah. And so they, they kind of are like, okay, you're infected. What the hell? And she kind of has to explain to them, like, I've been bitten three weeks ago. Right. Everyone turns within 24 hours. This is three weeks old. You can I'm immune. You see how old looking it is, too. Yeah. <clears throat> That's completely like healed over and stuff yeah. like that. So she's basically showing them I'm immune and this is why I need to go to where I need to go. But they were very like, do we believe you? Do we not believe you? Are we being screwed over here by the fireflies by making them like take this and then having basically Ellie kill them? Like they were kind of really hesitant on it. And then you see them actually leave Boston and you can see Mm -hmm. the scenery. You can hear the clickers too. I thought that was really cool. Oh yeah, yeah, they threw them in there. And then... If pans over to Joel's apartment where that song kicks on, and I I don't really I was born in '89, so I don't really know a lot of '80s songs. So whatever song they picked, I didn't know that that was an '80s song. I don't even said. I don't you, even recall you, you, which one it was. I think you insinuated that it was an '80s song. Well, yeah, because that would make sense that it's danger. Right, and then they showed scenes for the coming up season, and everything they showed. I pretty much was like, I know that part. I know that part. Yep. But I also just want to take a moment to say that I love the, the song they played in the scenes for next week because it's this is a song called All Gone, like No Escape. This is a song they played when Joel pretty much essentially saves Ellie at the end. and But they remastered it, so I thought it was really beautiful. But there's one particular scene, the very end of scenes for the last next week, and it was with, this, you just see, like, um, bullets falling on the ground, Joel's foot stepping, and immediately, immediately him, him and I were like, <gasps> Because we knew that's the very end of the mm-hmm. game. That's the hospital scene. And they just showed us that. And yep. I got so excited. I got so freaking excited. That's going to be a rough episode. For oh sure. Oh my god, yeah. The, the finale episode is going to be rough. Unless for some reason they make that like nine. And then do left behind after. But I think what you think. Where yeah, they're going to so do left I, behind kind of sprinkled in. Yeah, so what I think is going to happen when it comes <clears> to the whole segment of left behind. When there's a moment when you're at the college, Joel falls and he gets stabbed through the side of his body. Then This is all in the game. Ellie goes and takes him and tries to, you know, hide him somewhere. And then she's encountering this group, like David's group. And this was a whole big mess over there. You're playing Ellie for a short period of time. Well, in the left behind scene, you see her doing back and forth, like, flashbacks. And, like, her going to, like, this, this mall trying to find a, a suture kit to, like, sew up his, like, his wound and, like, to, you know, stitch him up and... She's at this mall and she's trying to save Joel. She keeps having flashback memories of her and Riley. So you kind of get to see Riley's story. So I'm assuming that's kind of how they'll in, in, do that into the story. That's I would, what I, I would think. Assume, yeah. That that's like when she's trying to save Joel, trying to find a way to cure, cure him or heal him. That's when you start getting flashbacks of like how she became infected to begin with. Right. So what do you think of the episode? I thought it was awesome. Did you love it? Yeah, it was fantastic. No. Um, I thought it was interesting that they originally had episode one ending when he picks up the the little boy from the car and throws him into the fire mm-hmm. that was the end of episode one what really yes that was a part of the podcast that you missed so <clears throat> he picks up the boy throws him into the fire and it kind of just shows joel like how hard he is now right before that scene you had met ellie in chains in the room so they kind of introduce you a little bit to ellie and then boom they cut scene and then everything with um the Marlene and the Fireflies and all that, and then Ellie being given to Joel and Tess, that happens in episode two. Um, and he, Craig Mazin and Neil Druckmann were like, this is this is why it's so beneficial having such a good team with you, is uh, like good partners with the other side, with HBO, is they had sent those the episodes to HBO, and there's two team members, there are two reps from HBO that watched it, and they were like, look, we love this. They're great. However, it's like the first episode doesn't make you want to come back. It doesn't give you the, 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 the catalyst of the show. Everyone thinks is what is the biggest part of the show? Some people would answer and say, oh, it's Sarah dying, but it's not. No. The biggest part of the show is when Joel meets Ellie because that's when the entire rest of the story starts. Yeah, that's when the game starts, essentially. That has to happen in the first episode. Okay. So sense. they rewrote the first episode to factor that part in and made it longer. Well, I <clears> thought <throat> it was fantastic. And as someone who has played the game 
so much. I played the game way more than he ever has. <laughs> I think I've played it three times. You played it, what, five? Six. Like, I mean, I played it so much. Because you got to remember, the game came out in 2013. So mm -hmm. the second time. game came out in 2020. There was like seven year period of there not being another game. So I'd, I'd go back to that game every single year because it's one of my favorite games in the entire world. So as someone who avidly knows that game in and out, knows the whole score, knows everything happened, I walked away from the episode going, that was freaking great. I mm -hmm. loved every second of it. And it was yeah. really cool because our, our friends Paige and Jarvis, who have not played the game, who don't really know too much about it, they walked away from the episode saying they thought it was absolutely fantastic and right. are looking forward to seeing what happens So you next. get both the audiences. Like, even in the podcast, both, like, Neil Druckmann and Craig Mazin were talking about how they have to write this show for two different people simultaneously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have to write the show for someone that has no idea what's going on, the average viewer. And then they have to write the show in a way that pleases someone that knows every little detail and it needs to match. <laughs> well, me too. Yeah. Every single detail needs to line up or yeah. it's or it's going to be the cursed video game adaptation that everything else is. Yeah. So I think they did. for I the first the time ever, I think like this is a fantastic video game adaptation so far. They did the best of both. Yeah. They were able to capture so much. Yes, things got switched around. Some, some things are like, oh, that didn't happen. Or they completely switched a scene. They did in a way that still works, and they're mm -hmm. still captivating the essence of what needs to be captivated, so that's why I'm still really excited about it, and I can't wait till next week, because next week I know, like, the, I know exactly, like, where they should be at in the game-wise, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, like, mm -hmm. it's kind of cool to, like, know what's going to happen and, like, kind of figure it out, but I'm sure they're still going to throw some surprises at us, for sure, and I'm really curious to see how they're going to portray, like, the clickers, the runners, the bloaters... The crawlers or the... the, the I think the, we'll see like, our first clicker next episode. For sure. For sure. But, mm -hmm. like, I'm just curious to see how they're going to look. Because... I think something else is going to happen next episode, too. What? If you don't want spoilers, leave. But... But Tess? I think Tess dies next episode. Oh, yeah. I think at so the too. end of the episode. It would make sense. Yeah. Because so much has to happen. Mm -hmm. And then episode three would start them by themselves. Yeah. Until but who knows? Them. Maybe maybe they even fast forward that and have Tess die in the middle. And then they really get into her, but like I don't know. I don't know. There's only ten episodes, and they a lot that happens. Both showrunners have confirmed they don't like filler episodes, so this whole season is going to be all of game one, and this is an eighteen hour, eighteen plus hour game. <laughs> yeah. So it's so good. It's so good. They might fast forward things more than I think, but I we'll think epi next episode, I think Tess dies. But I'm just, I'm just really curious just because uh, in the first game, when it comes to clickers, they don't have echolocation. So, like, you can hide. You can pretty much sneak up behind them. You can stand right in front of them. They still don't see you. But in the second game, they evolve the clickers to a sense where now they have echolocation and they can see you by mm -hmm. just, like, doing that little clicking ah, noise. They yeah, can so see you're you. not hiding behind, like, a cabinet. They'll see you. And they'll that come echo after hits you. you and they got you. So I'm curious to see if they're going to put that in the in the show. Mm -hmm. Like if they're going to show that aspect. And if they're going to show like the bloaters taking these boils off their body and throwing and it at you. And chucking them at you so it like right. spores, spores grenade. Or like the silence or the silence or like the, the, the crawler people that kind of like blend into the wall. And they hide there in the wall and they pop out and they get you and they're super quiet. And they sneak up on you. I'm curious to see if they're going to put that element in there as well. Yeah. We're really excited, needless to say. I think it's I think for the first episode I have not seen one negative review in terms of the game. I've seen in terms of the show, I've seen everybody say how phenomenal it is. From non game players to game players, everyone all around gives a consensus this was absolutely the best episode. Yeah. The best video game adaptation I think anyone has seen and the music, the, the score, I mean I mean from the music to the way they played it to the actors, I just thought it was overall absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I'm really excited. The next yeah. nine weeks need to fast forward. <laughs> I know, I know. So, yeah, guys, that was our kind of like chit chat. Get ready with me while we talk about the first episode of The Last of Us. You guys know how much I love the game so much. You guys know how much he loves the game. I've been mm -hmm. live streaming it for you guys. I'll actually be live streaming The Last of Us Part 2 tonight as well because it's just so much fun. And I just want to thank you for coming on to my... I was about to say my show, but my channel, kind of. to talk about <laughs> The Last of Us. You guys always ask to see Corey. Actually, they want to see you do my makeup. You're welcome. Um, maybe. You haven't done it in, like, years. 200,000 likes on this video, and I'll do her makeup next Sunday. 20 likes. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I just, you know, I appreciate you coming on and sitting here and talking about this stuff. And to all those who watch this, I know it's completely different, but I like to show my love of makeup and video games into one. I thought it would be so fun just to kind of bring the two 
worlds together. Mm-hmm. When worlds collide. Yeah, yeah. So that is it for today's video, guys. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure you guys give this video a cheeky thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you guys have not already. So I do post four to five videos every single week. Make sure you guys head over to our our channel, The Florida Life, though we haven't posted in What's such the Florida a hot, life? such a hot minute. We haven't posted. We need to. Make sure you guys go subscribe to that channel because you guys get to see my cool Our pictures <laughs> with my amazing husband, Corey, and to all the patron members that you see running over his face. Thank you guys so much for everything you guys have ever done. And to my subscribers and viewers, thank you guys so much for being here. Whether you guys like this video, you guys thumbs down this video, you guys subscribe, you guys are not subscribed. Either way, thank you guys so, so much for being here. I love and appreciate each and every single one of you. So with that said, guys, I love you and I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye! Bye.